A tentative recovery in 2020-21 and increasingly gloomy developments in 2022. That broadly sums up the IMF's view and outlook on global growth and the global economy. The IMF has cut its global growth forecast while upping the inflation estimates for the world. Joining me now to talk about where we are headed in 2022 and more importantly next year and where India figures in the scheme of things is the Managing Director of the IMF, Priscilla Georgieva. Thanks very much for joining us here on the Global Dialogue. It's a pleasure to have you back here uh, on the program and back in India as well. It is my great pleasure and honor to be on the program again. You know, let me start by talking to you about your visit here to mm -hmm. India. You've spent the last three days here. You've met the finance minister, you've met the prime minister, uh, and you will soon be meeting with the new president as well. I want to understand from you what your big takeaway is from the conversations that you've had here in India. First of all, that uh, India on this dark horizon you described is a bright spot. And it is not by coincidence, it is the outcome of reforms uh, India has undertaken, especially in the field of digitalization. And second, that India is truly poised for its big moment on international stage. As it takes over the G20 uh, presidency, it has a lot to offer from its own experience, and it is going to be leading in a particularly challenging time on the ground of its credibility as a country that has been serious about reforms and serious about leapfrogging in the 21st century. Well, you, you, you know, you said that this is going to be India's big moment as it takes on the G20 presidency next year. Uh, you talked about the digitization benefits as well. But I want to understand from you uh, the role that India can play as it takes on the G20 presidency. For instance, in your conversations with the finance minister, I understand that she yeah. urged the IMF to take a proactive role as far as global regulations on cryptocurrency yeah. is concerned. So what do you believe can be the role that India... Uh, in coordination with the IMF can play on some of these crucial issues? Uh, I see uh, three areas where we can work very productively together. We can support the Indian uh, presidency. Uh, first, with strengthening the multilateral system. It is now being challenged. There are forces of fragmentation and they're going to be damaging for emerging markets and developing economies. Let's remember that the emerging world quadrupled its economy in the last three decades and 1.3 billion people have been lifted out of poverty largely because of international cooperation. So there is a lot at stake uh, and India will be speaking on behalf of emerging markets and developing uh, countries. We will be supporting that wholeheartedly. Secondly, the world is changing very rapidly especially in the area of uh, digital. It was put on steroids by the pandemic, uh, and in the world of money, both CBDCs and crypto stable coins uh, have emerged very strongly, but they're not regulated. So India is right to call on the IMF to make sure that crypto is not the new wild, wild west. And we are very aligned in how we think about the necessity of regulation to one, differentiate across different asset classes uh, from those that are not backed, like Bitcoin, to stable coins that are backed, but they bring a different risk of, say, dollarization if US stable coin is the one to dominate. So we have to work together to advance regulation uh, for the benefit uh, to take advantage of what crypto can deliver fast and cheap payments but also manage the risks uh, to cyber security mm -hmm. and especially how money gets on the darker side of the world and uh, third we see huge advantage of working in uh, sync with india at the time when debt sustainability is becoming a growing concern. Uh, there is the G20 common framework for debt resolution. It is very important to have a rule book that makes uh, access to it and using it clear. 
possibly expand it so countries like Sri Lanka can find a home in the common uh, framework. Uh, and India being a new donor, a new lender, uh, can play a very important role in advancing uh, that uh, work. And of course, we have many other issues like climate, yeah. uh, where I expect the G20 uh, to find space for everybody to see eye to eye on these global challenges. You know, you've spoken about several of the opportunities and several of the global challenges as well. Let me address each one of those. Uh, but before, before I move away from cryptocurrencies, just a mm. quick word on how soon you believe we will or we could possibly see a global regulation or a global architecture uh, being put in place, given the fact that this is, you know, so many different jurisdictions we're talking about. We already have a roadmap uh, that uh, the uh, FSB has been pursuing with streams of work. What we are expected to do, and the finance minister was very clear about it, is to bring the voices of all our 190 members mm -hmm in this conversation and make sure that regulation is done with an eye to the interests of different uh, uh, groups of countries. Uh, in fact, uh, the Prime Minister expanded the request uh, by saying, well, it would be very good if the fund looks more broadly in India's experience with digitalization for inclusion, for improving fiscal performance, collect more taxes, improve the quality of spending, uh, for how India dealt with the pandemic. Uh, so we intend to uh, dedicate the team to work specifically on the issue of uh, crypto, bring the two other key uh, agencies, BIS and FSB, so together we can have a more pragmatic, with clear deliverables, roadmap uh, towards more regulated uh, uh, space. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, it is fantastic for India to use its presidency to excite other developing countries to take this road of digitalization for more transparency, for more trust of the citizen, and also to do what India is doing, allow people to own their data and use their data for their benefit. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, let me talk to you now about the global challenges that we are faced with. And as I pointed out, uh, the IMF in its latest uh, outlook has cut lower the global growth forecast for 2022 as well as for 2023. Uh, you know, you have said that uh, those estimates have a downside risk associated with them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the risks that you spoke of have already materialized. Mm -hmm. So are we now staring at a recession, at least in large parts of the world, how real is that as of today? What I can tell you is that um, uh, inflation has proven to be much more stubborn than we thought it would be. Why? Because of the triple crisis, pandemic, war, and then cost of living uh, crisis that fuels inflation from its end, uh, you know, by people demanding more compensation. So we are in a place where it is paramount for central banks to strive for achieving a place where the stability of the price signals is secured again. What does it mean? It means tightening, higher interest rates, and higher interest rates uh, when, when they're led by the Fed mean more strength for the dollar, depreciation of other currencies. How would that impact growth? Negatively. I can tell you, we got, since we issued our last forecast, we got the uh, second quarter, the world economy shrank by 2%. Uh, India, by the way, is performing well on a quarter by quarter. Uh, it is over 13% growth, but even India is now underperforming vis-a-vis -vis original projections. What does it mean for uh, 2023? What it means is that uh, this slowdown will translate into recession in some countries. It is early to say whether it would be widespread recession, but I can tell you, for many countries, even if they are in positive growth territory, it would feel like a recession uh, if we are to just project the factors I described. But let's remember that Mother Nature this year has shown that we have been complacent for far too long. That would mean that harvest for next year 
may be lower and pressure on food prices may remain quite strong, fueling this uh, necessity of action on the monetary policy side. Very difficult time for fiscal policy. Why? Because fiscal space has shrunk during and after the pandemic, and the remaining is being pressured because more people are suffering, more businesses are at risk. How to deploy limited fiscal space in a most targeted manner is crucial so fiscal policy doesn't become the enemy of monetary policy, fueling more inflation and as a result, higher interest rates. Mm. Very difficult time and in this very difficult time, my biggest concern is that ironically we need a coordination more, we need each other more, but there is more fragmentation. It is tougher to bring the world together. While it is tougher to bring the world together on many of these global challenges that you spoke of, there has been coordinated, synchronized action, at least as part of central banks. Uh, since July of last year, we've seen mm -hmm. 75 central banks move in terms of raising rates. The Fed has made its path clear. The ECB hiked rates by 75 basis points. You have urged policymakers to act now, mm. or you believe that the pain will be exacerbated. How much more do you believe we are likely to see rates move higher before uh, you know, inflation can be less of a challenge than it is today? We are still uh, hoping that what has happened, and you're absolutely right, there has been synchronized action by central banks, will translate in 2023 in moderating inflation. Too early to say whether by the end of 23 we can take a breath and say it is in the rear view uh, mirror, but, but the trajectory is clear. We already see that in the United States. What is more concerning is synchronized fiscal policy, and we are still seeing quite a variety of response from the fiscal side. In some countries, uh, supporting uh, through energy subsidies or controlling energy prices, uh, which is not the, the best use of public money, it is not targeted. Uh, so rich people benefit as well as poor people. Uh, that lack of synchronization towards more targeted, more effective fiscal policy is a concern. Why? Because of what I said, that can put fiscal policy and monetary uh, policy uh, in a clash to be avoided. This is why what we are proposing is when we come together for the annual meetings uh, in October to concentrate on shaping up the right fiscal policy response so we can have best deployment of scarce public money at this time. And I can tell you at the IMF we are already stepping up for our vulnerable members. We have received a number, number of requests uh, including uh, Sri Lanka, a country in, in your neighborhood. Uh, and we are very uh, eager and able to provide support early. And my message to everybody is, if you see trouble down, down the road, come precautionary so we can help you to prevent a, a difficult, uh, more difficult time, more pain ahead. I want to talk to you about uh, food inflation and specifically one of the challenges of food protectionism that is something that you have cautioned mm -hmm. policymakers against. Was this something that came up in the conversations here in India? Because India has decided to go down the path of imposing export duties as well as bans on several food commodities. We saw India uh, using that kind of restriction and then when conditions improve, removing these restrictions. And I very much hope it would be the case this time around. What India is experiencing is a, um, a harvest that is quite problematic because of weather conditions. Uh, and uh, India has almost 1.4 billion people to feed. This being said, it is not in the interest of India to indict others to go for that kind of restriction because it undermines open and free trade that is beneficial for India. So as India did last time around, when there was a restriction imposed and then it was relaxed, 
uh, when there was clarity that the food situation is not as dramatic. I would really uh, hope that we would see the same uh, conscious and careful uh, action this time around. The sooner, the better. You know, you spoke about Sri Lanka and the IMF has uh, reached an agreement with Sri Lanka and the current dispensation for about a 48-month period. How confident do you feel about that turnaround? And more importantly, you said that several other countries have also reached out to the IMF mm -hmm. seeking uh, extended uh, help. Uh, which are the parts that you're mm -hmm. most concerned about? Which are the countries, the regions that you're most concerned about? I know that you have expressed uh, apprehensions about the state of several countries in the African continent. Mm -hmm. Which parts of the world are most vulnerable when we talk about debt sustainability? Well, uh, let's look at the data. Uh, we have about 25% of emerging market developing economies at or near debt distress. Uh, Sri Lanka is a, a case in hand. Lebanon has been a case for a long time. Uh, we know that the situation is much worse for low-income countries. Over 60% of low-income countries are at or near that distress. Uh, and we see middle-income countries that traditionally would be with strong fundamentals, avoiding uh, falling in that uh, category like Ghana, now being in, in, in it. Ghana has also approached the uh, fund. We are working uh, intensively with the uh, government of Ghana. What has changed is this frequent frequency of exogenous shocks. Mm. Shock upon shock upon shock. Even countries with strong fundamentals are becoming vulnerable. And the lesson for us is that we have to concentrate much more on building resilience to shocks. And prudent fiscal policies, sound buffers, this is even more important in this new world we live. Uh, when I look at uh, low-income uh, countries, uh, I am really worried. A country like Malawi, uh, no fuel, no food, and yet that is unsustainable, makes the entry of the IMF uh, more difficult. My message to the creditors, especially the large creditors, like China, 37% of uh, uh, loans to low-income countries are from China, or the private sector, which is even a bigger cred a creditor, uh, is you have done a needed job to provide financial resources for growth. That is not necessarily bad, but in the environment of these shocks, when that is not sustainable, show leadership, move rapidly to provide debt relief to countries so we can help them, they can step up on their feet, they can grow again and uh, be a viable uh, investment opportunity. One of the other goals, that, and I know that mm -hmm. that is something that you've been passionate about as well, uh, is bridging the gender gap. Mm -hmm. And uh, the IMF has put together a comprehensive strategy to be able to help member nations do that. Does it worry you that while some progress has been made through the pandemic, things have gotten worse, not better. It does, and this is what motivated us uh, to move fast with our uh, mainstreaming gender strategy, uh, because it is a huge loss for uh, the economy that women are pushed back. Uh, gender inequality is, of course, morally wrong. You and I can vouch for that, uh, but it is also really uh, bad economics. Uh, women uh, are a great, um, uh, force for entrepreneurship. They are fantastic in terms of how they use their income for their families, for education, for health, mm. for their children. Uh, and also women uh, have the ability to contribute much more broadly in society than currently in many countries they do. So what we think is viable for the fund, since we are about macroeconomic, financial stability, growth and employment to pressure for gender-based budgeting so governments think how their public money can bring this incredible resource uh, into the marketplace, uh, how we can get more inclusion of women, especially financial inclusion, and again, India is a bright spot in that regard as well, uh, and how we can get the uh, story of gender equality to be more about the well-being of families, communities, and countries than just about mm. women. 
I, I think that's that's aptly put. We need to involve all stakeholders in the conversation and not make it just about the women or mm. for the women. But you know, I I want to go back again to the issue of fund flows because that is something mm. that you've been cautioning about as well. You talked about the dollar strength and the implications that plus the higher interest rates are likely to have on fund flows, and we have seen fund mm -hmm. flows dry up to emerging markets. Uh, this is what I think uh, the fourth consecutive month that we've seen mm -hmm. that happen. Uh, is it likely to get worse and what could be the implications of that? Well, let me start with the uh, positive. Emerging markets actually were quite uh, fast to recognize that uh, they need to tighten monetary policy and they did it, uh, many of them, before advanced economies moved. Uh, that has helped uh, not to get in a very dramatic uh, uh, discourse. Uh, however, you're right, uh, there is this flight to safety and what it means for emerging markets is to double down on making investment climate really attractive. Identify barriers, remove those barriers, and be much more aggressive on issues that have been holding investments back, especially transparency of contracts uh, that applies also to debt. Who do they borrow from, at what conditions, uh, and uh, uh, overall uh, good governance and of course we know very often we say good governance mm. what we mean is fight corruption. Do you anticipate that 2023 is going to be far worse than 2022? It would be worse. How much worse depends on on variety of factors that we don't know. The longevity of the war, whether there would be any other shock, but there is one factor in our hands how collaborative we are. The more we work together, the less pain there will be. But is there any indication of that? You said that we're living in a you fragmented know, world, so is there any indication of more synchronized collaborative action? There are these good signals. Central banks coming together. When did they come together? When it became really scary. Uh, I hope we can come together on other issues as well, on trade, on debt, on climate, and uh, it is a bit a chicken and egg. If we give up and say, oh, it's fragmented, we can't do it, then it is likely to be even worse. If we just roll our sleeves and work to show everybody why it is in your interest to collaborate with others, and then we build a platform for this collaboration, uh, multilateral institutions today have a huge responsibility to be the place of unity as challenging that may be. You know, you talked about central bankers coming together as the world got scarier. What is the thing that scares you the most from the perch that you sit at? And what is the mm -hmm. one thing that gives you hope today? Uh, what scares me the most is us falling on a down spiral in terms of global cooperation and justifying it with we haven't been quite fair during the golden era of uh, globalization. Not everybody benefited, but we kind of pretended that was the case. Mm. So be honest and then identify where we have problems and then tackle them. Don't shy away from them. Uh, and I I worry that uh, the uh, forces of pushing us away may get even stronger in the context of prolonged war and a war that may have other unexpected uh, spillovers. What gives me hope? We people are very inventive and we do have the smarts to overcome challenges. Take the pandemic. In one year, we had vaccines. So if only we could invent a vaccine against moving away from each other, a vaccine that makes us hug each other, the world would be a great uh, place. 
Well, and we hope that if we do get that vaccine, it is available and accessible to all because <laughs> yes. that wasn't the case with the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Kristalina Georgieva, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us here on the Global Dialogue. Uh, we appreciate your time and I suspect you're going to have a very busy year going ahead. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. With that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of the Global Dialogue. From all of us here on the team, goodbye. Thanks for watching.